Welcome grade 10 to yet another exciting life science lesson. I know that you just can't wait every single week. You're just hanging on to the edge of your seats, waiting to see what we're going to do this week. And I'm sure most of you are going to be glad to hear that we're starting on the human, all right, organs and systems today. I know even though we try and make it as exciting as possible, you don't always like all right, <laughs> the plant section. As you can see on the front, what we're going to start with, we're going to look at the human skeleton. Right? If, you, if I take you back to where we've come so far, we started off with this whole concept of a cell and then we took the cell and we added cells that have the same structure and the same function and we looked at all the different tissues. You'll remember, next week we're going to go over it specifically when we do bone, we did, we did bone tissue, right? And today what we're going to do is we're gonna take all those tissues and we're gonna add them together to form different organs and that organ we're going to fit together to make the human skeleton, the whole system of the skeletal system. But before we get into the interesting part of trying to label all the bones of your, of your skeleton, what we're going to do is we just need to do a little bit of background information. Okay, so if you have a look at the overview today, what we need to do, just have a brief understanding that there are different types of skeletons. Oopsie, here we go. We have different types of skeletons, right, that certain animals have, um, they need different types, and we're just going to look at the basic ones there, and then obviously we're going to look at the good stuff, which is the function, all right, of look at the structure and the function of the human skeletal system. All right. I've put, it in a, I've put it in a table format and just so that you have an un understanding of okay, what kind of skeletons are, do we looking at, examples of animals that have those different skeletons and we're also going to notice that the skeletons that we find might have an advantage or it might have a disadvantage right to the animal. Now the first skeleton that we look at is a hydrostatic skeleton. Now if I use the word hydro all right, that should tell you that they use water. Now, when we look at a skeleton, a skeleton is an animal's support system. When we looked at plants, we looked at the concept of xylem and phloem and kalenchyma and sclerenchyma. They were the support system. They kept the plant upright. Okay, and here in animals, right, we also, animals, because they move, they need to have a different kind of skeleton. Now, your very, if I could say, simple animals, right, have a hydrostatic skeleton. And what is that is they have water. It's a, a water-based cavity, right? If we have a look here at the earthworm, right, if you have a look at uh, examples that I could also put over here is the jellyfish, okay? Um, sea anemones, sea anemones, those of you who've watched Nemo, all right, so they look like, they look like little, little plants, but they actually are animals, and they're very simple, and with that, they need to have, they soft-bodied, all right, they are soft-bodied. Now, the advantages of this is quite nice and easy, is that because they're so soft, all right, you will also see that they need to be near water, Obviously, the water needs to, they need to have a more aquatic lifestyle, even earthworms. Earthworms don't live in water, but they live in moist soil. Right? And because they don't have a hard outer shell, what's actually easy is, is that the, anything that they have, anything that they need, usually comes in and out by diffusion. So we, we, we say that it's, it's quite simple. Now, problem with it is that you are restricted to size. When we talk about sea anemones and earthworms, and you're going to hear next year, we look at things called hydra. You're going to do a lot of this in the grade 11 all right, syllabus. What happens is they are restricted. They have to be near water. So if you have drought or um, anything like that, if there's a lack of water, your organism is obviously going to die. Also, because they're quite soft, they don't have this great protection, right? So if you stand on them or if you squash them, they are going to be able, they're going to get squashed quite quickly. And if you notice what I've, what the, the organisms that I've um, looked at, you will also see that they don't do a lot of movement. Very often we reply, we, we, we say that they are sessile. 
Sessile means that they can move, but they don't always move. Okay, so that's our first kind of skeleton. Our second kind, and these are the creepy ones, you see there's an icky black spider at the top there, exo, all right, when we refer to an exo, we say it's on the outside, all right? So our support system, our strength is found on the in the outside right, and protects everything on the inside. Now, when we look at it, lots of you I know, I think you start to think of a tortoise, um, you start to think of a snail, all right? A tortoise has both. It has a shell on the outside and it has bones on the inside. But here is a cute little snail on the side over here, really, really gross. All right, a spider, you can think of crabs, you can keep, think of cra um, crayfish, um, all those kind of things. Basically what they have is they've got this hard outer body. And the word calcareous, all right, means calcium. So basically what it is, is, is you, the calcium is hardened to form these harder outer structures. Chitinous or chitinous, remember that was a carbohydrate right, that makes on the outside, like for example, the insect, like for example, a beetle, right, when you, when you squash that hard outer side, or they can be nice and leathery. So here, these, these are more harder, the calcareous and the chitinous, all right, or the chitinous, however you wish to pronounce it, and then you get your more, your, your softer ones, your leathery, those are your icky spiders. Okay, now, what's good about it, what's good about having an a skeleton on your outside, you got a shell. So you can imagine if you're a sh if you're a jellyfish or if you are a turtle, that it's going to have your shell as a turtle is going to protect you more and it supports you. Okay, and now what we're going to start to see is if we look at these little guys, they move a lot. All right. So if they move a lot, what happens is very often we can attach muscles to those hard parts. Also, when you have something hard, we have protection, all the internal organs are prevented um, from in any kind of injury. What's another thing you'll see our next point here? Okay, drying out, because with the, lots of the examples that I gave you live on land. Okay, so what have we noticed that they don't, they've moved from this reliance on water to being more right terrestrial. Even though aquatic animals do have it, right, they're not as reliant on this, the water for the skeleton because they've got this hard right outer shell. Now that hard outer shell can be a bit of a problem because it limits their size. They can only grow as much as the outer covering allows them to. So sometimes, often you might see they molt, right? They might need to, uh, they need to, their covering needs to come off for a little while so that, that, that they can build a new one, so to speak, so that they can grow. And when they do that, they're quite, um, they're quite vulnerable to predators. So, you know, and again, you don't want that. Also, again, if you crush it, it's going to die. Also, the movement is limited. Remember, it's a hard outer covering. It doesn't, it allows for movement, but it doesn't allow for free movement. Now, here, when we say impermeable to gases, what does that mean? It's hard, all right? When we say it's hard, gases cannot diffuse in or diffuse out, so we can, no diffusion. So what do we see here? If we look at our insects, and you'll see that next year, we actually have to have a special organs for respir respiratory organs. So we're going to need a type of mouth. We're going to need like a trachea or a windpipe or something, and we might, and we're even going to get as far as obviously needing lungs. Now, which leads us to the last type, of skeleton, and as you can see, our skeleton is dancing, it looks also happy over there, is an endoskeleton. Endo means, I'm sure you can gather that, on the inside. So the skeletal system, we say, is eternal, okay? So it's internal, it's found inside the body, and it's usually made up of bone or cartilage. And we have looked at both bone and cartilage. Very often when we look at cartilage, right, those are going to be your fish. Okay, so all vertebrates, right, endoskeletons, fish, frogs, reptiles, birds, and mammals, 
they are all going to have a skeleton on the inside. Okay, now what is the advantages of having it on the inside? Okay, if we look at the, the disadvantages of it on the outside, we can grow, all right? We're not limited to growth, right? Because our organs, everything will grow with us. It's, we haven't got this, this shell on the outside that's squeezing us in, so we can grow. Also, when we look at the skeleton today, what we're going to see is our skeleton is there to protect us. We have organs on the inside, and our skeleton protects those organs. We're also going to see it provides support, right? It keeps us upright. We need to move, so we need to have muscles attached to our skeleton. And what we're going to look at next week is we're going to look at joints, right? How our body is able to move far more freely, but how we arrange, right, the different tissues in our skeletal, skeletal system. Now, obviously, a disadvantage, right? When we say more vulnerable to heat and cold, because we're almost exposed, we have to be reliant on our body, right? It's a process called homeostasis. Right? We are reliant for us, right, to keep a constant body temperature. So we need to make sure that we have got energy, right, going all the time. And obviously, we cannot dry out either. If you can think of maybe a fish or a frog and some reptiles, they are still reliant on water, right, as they as their medium on which they live. Now, so obviously, if we can have a look here, the human skeleton, us, this is us, right? That if we were to look inside, this is what we look like. And obviously, because it's inside our body, we have an endoskeleton. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to see, we're going to learn all about the bones. So you're simply going to label most of the bones in the skeleton. So when I say to you, it consists of 206 bones, right, all of you are, oh, that's so many. But what you tend to forget that sometimes, all right, what happens is lots of, if I have a look at the fingers, I don't have one fingers, finger, all right, I have 10 of them. So lots of the bones, all right, I have two of. So I have two arms, I have two legs, I have two feet, I have 12 ribs. So sometimes I don't have to learn all of them, right? One can be many. Now, when we look at the skeleton, right, I want you to notice we divide it into two sections. Now have a look at this diagram, but right? also have a look at the word that we use. When we look at the skeleton, what we notice is that there is a central part. Now axial, means central. So if I look at this blue section, what do I see here? That central, all right, also means middle. Now if I draw a circle around there and I draw a line straight there, what I have done is I've pinpointed to the middle of the body. So our first part of our skeleton which we're going to look at is called our axial. Now central, when we do the brain next year, not only is it literally in the center of our body, right, but what do we have inside our skull? We have our central nervous system. And central nervous system meaning literally the center of our body and the center of everything that is going to go on in our body. Then we have the pink section is an appendicular. Now, I don't know if you ever heard some, the word before, right? If you've written something and they say to you, it's at the appendix, right? The appendicular almost means at the end, right? At the end. I don't want to say at the back because that's confusing, but it means at the end. So what is it at the end of? It is at the ends of my axial skeleton. So I have the central portion, okay? And then what do I have? I have this, the ends of it are attached, right, my appendicular skeleton. Now what we're going to look at, right, when we look at our axial skeleton, what you need to be able to do is, we need to be able to label the skull, we need to be able to label all the different bones of the vertebral column, and this, the rib cage. They form the axial skeleton. The appendicular skeleton, 
right? That is the pectoral girdle. Now the pectoral girdle is what we commonly refer to as the shoulder. Okay, the upper limb, which we commonly call the arm. The pelvic girdle, which we call the hip, right? Or the pelvis and the lower limb, which we are going to then call the leg. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to look at the structure of your skeleton. Don't go away. Welcome back from your break. I hope you had a bit of a stretch, maybe something to drink, a little sip of water. Now we're going to carry on with the nitty gritty part of the skeleton. I'm going to go, I'm not going to go through certain sections quite quickly, but when it does come to this work, unfortunately, it boils down to plain studying. Right, you not so much understanding, but you need to be able right, to look at the diagram and you need to know the labels. I know sometimes it's a bit of a schlep, correct, it's a studying part. Some of you like the understanding part, but it needs to be done. Okay, guys, the first one we're doing is the concept of the skull. Now, I need you to understand that the concept of the skull, right, is the head, but we don't refer to it as a head. And if you will have a look at all the different diagrams that I have shown you, they color code it, right? Not one color meaning, all right, any specific thing, but why they use color is to show you that it's not one not one big bone, right? If you have a look here, all of these little lines are joints. And we're going to look at joints next week. And we call those sutures. So actual fact, what your skull is made up of is these whole lot of bones, right, that have joined together. Now, just a concept I want to clarify with you is the following. These parts over here, the numbers labeled A, B, C, D, Inside there, we're going to find the brain, right? And that is what they're going to do. They're going to protect the brain. And what those bones are, those bones, right, make up the cranium. So when we look at the skull, when we look at the skull, what we notice is that it's almost made up of two parts. It's the cranium, <coughs> sorry, the cranium, which is going to, all right, protect the brain, then that is why I put this diagram at the bottom here, then you have the face, all right? So this portion over here makes up the bones of your face. So when we look at, all right, when we look at the bones, these ones at the top over here make up the cranium, and you will learn about the different areas when you look at the, when you study when you study the brain, because for, the, for example, this is the frontal bone, right? You don't have to go into it in too much depth. Right? This is the occipital, but when you study in grade twelve, you're going to study the brain. You're going to see that the brain and the and the cranium have the same labels. Okay, so what else when I'm looking at the skeleton from the side? What else do I see? Okay, this is what's going to be my nose. So this is going to be a nasal bone. All right, and number E over here is going to be my cheek. It's got a nice big long name called the zygomatic bone. But if you remember the cheek, and it's very, very thin here. And that's why it's sometimes quite easy for it to break. And then we have, all right, the maxilla, which is a upper jaw, and then the only bone, the only bone that can move on the skull is called your mandible or your lower jaw. So there we go. If I look at this diagram over here, that's going to still be part of my cranium. Do you notice it actually forms part of your cranium and your face? And there would be my upper jaw, my lower jaw, Here's my cheeks. Okay, I'm going to put upper, lower, and as you can see, what do I find embedded in my jaw? I'm going to find my teeth. Now, something you need to remember, and I know you're going to forget, is at the bottom of the skull. This is a very important word, because when you get to grade 12, you're going to need to understand this concept of a foramen magnum. Okay, at the bottom of the skull, What's going to lead out here 
is going to be the spinal cord. It's actually at the part of the brain, the medulla oblongata, and it leads out of, right, out of this hole, and it's going to go down to become your spinal cord. Now what happens here is when you go in grade 12, the position of this foramen magnum is going to have an effect on whether you walk upright or whether you, it's called bipedalism, or whether you walk on fours, which is called a quadriceps. Okay, now I want you to have a look. I'm going to only give you one minute. All right, now I want to only give you one minute. What do you think the function of the skull would be? One minute. Okay, your time starts now. Okay, guys, I hope that you came up with more than just protects the brain. Okay, that is the most obvious one, protect the brain. Now, if you look, if you go back to the skull, what else does it do? What else does it do? Okay, how about it helps you to chew, right? Because what can the bottom of the mouth do? It can move because it's got teeth in it as well. So we've got move, we've got teeth. Ah, now I want you to have a look over here. You see what it does, that little hole over there, that's where your ears, all right, your little ossicles in your ears, where you hear. So that actually protects part of your ears. Now, what do you see here in the front? Look at these nice big, giant big holes. What does it also do? It's going to protect your eyes, all right? Your eyes are protected all around here in the eye socket. So they're very important, these organs of yours. So we have a nice protective. So we have protect the eye. Okay, so when it comes to the functions of the skull, okay, even though we just said protect the brain, it has a far more, it has a much better, all right, or far more functions. Another thing the skull is also going to do, which leads us to point number two. The skull, now listen to the word, articulates. It's quite a big word. You might come across it. Articulate means to join. So what does, you know, there's a fine, the hip bones connect to the leg bone, right? So that is exactly what happened. The skull is now going to be co connected to this term called the vertebral column. Now, guys, you can't call it a spine. It's not a spine. Spine, your spinal cord are the nerves that are inside the vertebral column. Remember, we are looking at the bone. So, okay, so what do we have? If we have a look over here, we will see that we have different kinds of bones running from our head. We can see in this area over here, running all the way down from our head, right, almost until we get to our hips, actually almost at our hips. And what we see is, is there are different bones that are joined together to make this one long string. Now, what we, how we name them is, we, th there are different areas. The, the, your, your vertebral column has got different areas. And I'm sure you guys have all watched all these hospital dramas where they said, oh, it's hurted at the C1 or the T1 or the L1. Right? What does that mean? <clears throat> what it means is, from the head here, we have got certain vertebrae that are very similar, so they form like a, a similar region. So you will see here, the first one, and at the top over here, on this side, you will see, it gives you how many there are. So from the skull, in your neck region, and if you have a look at them, they are small. They are very small, because what do we need? 
we need mobility. We don't want something that's, that's heavy. We want to be able to move our neck nice and easy. And that is called the cervical vertebra. All right, there we go, the cervical vertebra. Then the cervical vertebra, they, then they start to change shape because they now become part of a different region. And when they're part of a different region, they have a different function. And this part of the body, when you did maybe in primary school, you heard, you learned about the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. So your chest, what you call your chest, is called your thorax. So the 12, right, the 12, there we go, there is 7, the 12 vertebra that make up that region are called your thoracic vertebra. Then we go to the vertebra at the bottom. They are called your lumbar, lumbar, right? They're your nice big, yeah, your yellow ones. And if you ever have a lumbar puncture, those are the ones they're going to want to get at. And there's going to be five of them. There are five lumbar vertebra. And those vertebra are quite big because this, right, is where your weight is. So because your weight is here, they need to be quite big and sturdy because you're going to apply lots of your weight over there. Now when we get to the last little bit, now you would notice, I said in the beginning, if we go back, there are 33 vertebra. Now, if we have a look at those first three regions, we notice that each of those vertebra are separate. It's one vertebra on top of the other. Now this diagram over here shows you that. So we got one vertebra, then in between, guys, a simple rule, you don't want bone rubbing on bone. Right? When we're going to look at joints next week, you're going to see that as well. Bone mustn't rub on bone. Okay. So what you've got is, is intervertebral discs, all right? cartilage, fibrous cartilage, right? in between these discs that acts as shock absorbers. But what I find over here, okay, is that I have got, these are joint. So they're actually five, five vertebra. My sacrum is made up of five vertebra that are fused. And then we've got these small little ones at the bottom that looks like one bone, right? But it's not. It's actually four that are fused, and that is called your coccyx. And those of you who've ever fallen on it, you will know. Now, if you have a look at the vertebra, what are you going to notice? Guys, it is curved. Now, I'm going to give you one more minute because I want you to tell me why is your vertebra curved and not straight. Okay, very important. One minute, your time starts now. guys I hope you were standing up straight trying to get as straight as you could thinking about what would happen if my vertebral column was as straight as all right and what happens is why do you need the curves all right the curves give you flexibility all right so we have they flexible they give you flexibility all right what else do they do the curves let's go back here all right the curves also help you with your posture, okay, to help you stand upright. Have you ever seen somebody who's got a very bad posture, right? What do they do, right? They, they, they exaggerate their curves. So with all of this, with the flexibility, with the posture, what does it actually help us to do? 
stand upright. And stand upright, all right, is going to provide us with balance. Okay, so it's very important that we have a vertebral column that has got all of these curves. Okay, now the last one, all right, the last part of my axial skeleton is what we call the rib cage. Now the rib cage is a term that we refer to a few structures. Okay, now if you have a look at this diagram, what you will see, the first thing that is obvious should be that it's obviously your ribs. Okay, the rib cage is going to form a very important part of the structure. But bones need to join. That's the thing you need to learn. Bones need to join with things in order to provide stability. And what we have right in the front here is this bone called the sternum. You cannot call it your chest bone, it is your sternum. And that sternum, right, provides support for your ribs to attach. Now, if you have a look here, you're going to see, all right, these white parts over here. And those white parts are not bone. Those white parts are cartilage. Okay, they are cartilage. Now, why is that important? When, and we're going to learn about it next week when we do joints, cartilage to bone, the joint is more flexible. Bone to bone, we have very little movement. Okay, now, you're also going to notice that I have true ribs and I have false ribs. And at the bottom, I have floating ribs. What does that mean? I want you to have a look, number here, if you see my true ribs, each true rib has got its own cartilage. But when we get to ribs number 8, 9, 10, and 11, they all have to share. All right, sharing is caring, we say. All right, the ribs have to share. So they're not, they, we say they're false because they don't join directly to the sternum. All right, so these attach to the sternum, these don't. Now, if you have a look at the back over here, You've got ribs that go further down, and they are called floating ribs, and they are going to protect, at the back of your body, your kidneys. Okay, and you can see in here, if I draw it purple one, my lungs are going to be there, and there is going to be my heart. So my rib cage is essential in protecting the internal organs of my thoracic cavity. We're going to have a quick break, and then when we come back, we are going to learn all about the appendicular skeleton. So quick, quick, stretch, little bits of drink, and then we're going to start all right, our last little segment. Quick, quick. See you now. Okay, guys, again, I hope you had your stretch, your small little break. All right, you got all the muscles working again. And the last section that we have to look at is our appendicular skeleton. All right, in other words, we're going to call it our shoulder and our arms, right, and our, and our, our when we look at the top one, right, the pectoral, as I said to you, oops, we've got to get to the pen again. Okay, the pectoral is our shoulder. So we're going to look at our shoulder and our arm. And what we're going to see, right, when we look at the diagrams, we're going to see that the arm and the leg are very similar. There's just slight differences that we're going to need to look at. If you have a look below here, right, is going to be the diagram of right of the of the upper limb. Oopsie, we're going a little bit too too fast. The shoulder, right, and the the lower limb and the upper limb. Sorry, the arm. I'm trying to concentrate and move at the same time. Multitasking is not that thing. So I just want to try and speed up a bit the time so that you guys have got a good right concept of the anatomy of it. When talk about the pectoral girdle, that is your pectoral girdle. That is your shoulder. Now when it comes here, I know very often, right, we, we have common names for things like shoulder blade, right, or my collarbone, but we can't use that. The bone, the first bone in our pectoral girdle is our clavicle. And you guys do know that as your collarbone. Right, and the reason why it's called your collarbone is it's the bone where the collar of your collar of your shirt is usually going to be found. Now, this bone at the back here, it's at the back of your body. Right, it's at the back. It's at the back. It's your. It's almost like your wings. Some of you call it, and that is called your scapula. Now, these two bones, as I said, the bones are going to join, and that's a concept that we're going to look at next week. We're going. It's going to form a joint. 
and you're going to hear me talk about a ball and a socket joint. And that ball and socket joint actually enables the arm to move. All right, we want movement, movement. We want movement. We want free movement because most of the things that we do, we do with our arm. All right. So when our shoulder, our shoulder over here, right, forms, uh, um, forms like a stabilizing joint. But what it does, it actually forms the attachment for what we call our arm. Now, the, the top bone, you're going to see in our leg and in our arms, we generally have the same structure. We have a larger bone at the top, which is called our humerus, right, which is our funny bone. That's why you call it. Humerus means funny. And that forms, right, or joins with two bones on, this, on our forearm. Now, I just want you to have a look quickly. When it comes to anatomy, <coughs> guys, you will see the picture is always facing that way, palms out. This is the front of your hand, this is the back of your hand. So when we show a diagram like this, our palms are outwards, not, not inwards. So now you've got to learn which bone goes where. Now, I remember it, I've got a little way in which remember it, I quite, my, my kids and that, I can always remember Mr. Price clothing. And Mr. Price clothing always was RT. When Mr. Price clothing came out, it was called RT. And why do I say that? Because I have two bones. I have a radius, my radius, and my ulna. And I don't, me as well, I always try to remember which one is the radius and which one is the, the ulna. So I remember RT. And why I remember RT is my radius always goes where my thumb is. RT, because that is going to be my thumb, so the bone that's on the side of my thumb is going to be my radius, which means that the bone on the other side is going to be my ulna. Now, when we look at the bones of the hand, okay, these are all going to form the hand. The hand is divided into my wrist, the palm of my hand, let me go that way, palm, and then I've got my fingers. Now obviously those are all common terms. We need to know the more biological term. Now when we, call, when we talk about the bones of the hand, we talk about the wrist. We talk about carpals. Please remember it's with an A because if it's with an E, you're telling me it's the flower's reproductive structures. The bones of the palm of the hand are called metacarpals and my fingers always such a lovely word it rolls so nicely off the tongue is going to be my phalanges my finger bones are my phalanges now look here right there are three in each phalange so in each hand I've got 14 here I've got five and in the carpals I've got eight so when we're learning all the different bones we don't know to know every single one Lots of the bones, right, make up, lots of bones make up one structure. Now, when we look at the bones of the hip or the pelvis, right, you need to automatically realize that it looks slightly different to the bones of the shoulder. Now, the hip bones, again, when you see color here, here, and here, those actually are three bones that are fused together. So technically, they were once, all right, when we were younger in developing stages, they were actually not fused. But in, in growing and in the skeleton developing, the bones of the pelvis, and there's a right and there's a left, because you've got a right leg and a left leg, and you've got a right arm and a left arm, they need to be, right, they need to join together so that the legs can f come down from it. Now when we look at it, these bones are much thicker, right, much thicker than the pectoral girdle. Now the bones, that they're quite difficult to, to sometimes pronounce, but let's have a look at them. Guys, this is the ilium. Now if you do the digestive system, you will see that the ilium of the small intestine also comes and fits here. And you've also got an artery called the iliac artery. That, that also meets say. So you see this is like a common word that we use for the area of the hip. 
Then your, if I can say it is your sit bone, lots of you refer to it as your bum bone. We can say that because that is our butt, right? At the back of here, it almost looks like monkey bars. Go and have a look at your skeleton in class, right? When you see, when you see the bottom bones of the hips, you almost like want to take it and just swing on it, you know, if you were that small. And that is called your ischium. A little bit more difficult to remember, ischium, right? So you're going to need to maybe concentrate a little bit on that. Then in the middle here, this red bone is called your pubic bone or your pubis. Because what's going to happen here, obviously, if you're a male or female, what's going to be in the pelvis is your genitalia, right? Whether you are male, whether you are female. And joining, now remember, we want stability. Joining, these hips need to join to, right, there's a little bit of cartilage here, and that is called the pubic symphysis. Bone, not attaching to bone, we're joining with a little bit of cartilage, just gives us that little bit more movement. And we also need to, it needs to be attached to the axial skeleton. So the sacrum, right, plays a part. So if you have a look here, here you can see, because we couldn't see it so nicely in the last diagrams, there's your sacrum, made up the five bo bones that are fused, and there is your coccyx. When it comes to the pelvis, guys, you need to understand that there are differences between male and female. It's a nice question to ask. The male pelvis, our ladies are not wider, as such they are bigger. When we say they are wider, our hips are placed, right, separated further apart. And that is obviously for childbirth, okay? So the men, the hips are, are narrower. And the women's, we just put them out. We don't have bigger, right? The bones are not bigger, right? They just go slightly out like that. So we can make that bigger bowl shaped for the head of the baby during childbirth. Now, if you have a look, all right, I've asked you this question over here. Why is it thicker? Why is the pelvis thicker and stronger than the upper limb? Now, I'm not going to give you time now because I want, I want to do a few more questions. The reason being, right, is that the pelvis is your weight bearing. Right, it is your weight bearing. In other words, that is where you're going to apply pressure. And it would be quite, it would be sad for us and it, would, it wouldn't make sense if our bones were thin and were always to break or to buckle or to cause us pain. So when we look at how we are made, at the top here, we want flexibility, we want to be able to do things with our arms, with our hands. But what do we need to do with our legs? We need to be able to walk, we need to be kept upright, we need stability. So obviously our bones need to be thicker and our joints are going to need to be deeper. Now when we look at the bones of the leg, we have a look, I'm going to, going to go over here, you will see that it mirrors the bones of the arm. So where we have one bone in the humerus, in the leg, our upper bone is called our femur. That is also the longest, all right, the strongest bone in our body. Now we have a very funny little bone over here called the patella. And if you guys know, your patella, you were not born with one. It only comes, it only starts to develop after you're about, after one year, a little bit later. If you had a patella and you were to crawl, it would be sore because it protects the knee joint. So when you're still a baby, you need to learn how to crawl first. So the patella isn't there and it comes later. We often refer to it as a sesamoid bone. A sesamoid bone means the following. It's the only bone in the human body that doesn't join with another bone. Next, year when, next week when I bring the, the knee joint to you, I'm going to show you how the patella now you've got, now if we have a look at the leg, what do we have again? All right, two bones. Now, how do I remember which is which? The two bones are tibia and fibula. Now, what does that mean? There's two of them. I remember tibia as table, because which is the one that I always walk into the table with? This nice big one over here. Okay, that is going to be my tibia. Now any of you guys ever had a chicken leg and that's a small little thin bone when you have your chicken leg and then you've got this funny little, you can almost like use it as a toothpick, little bone at the side. 
right that's this bone over here and that is called the fibula now when we get to the foot the foot again mirrors the hand why because we have an ankle the same as we had a wrist we don't have palms of the hand but we have an arch sorry an arch of the foot and although we don't have fingers we call them toes now they sound very similar to the ones that we used when we looked at right the arm the ankle instead of now being a carpal is called a tarsal the arch of the foot not a metacarpal but a metatarsal and the toes same name luckily as the fingers and those are going to be your phalanges so we can see that the arms right mirror the different kinds that the same as the as the legs now when it comes to questions I'm going to just skip the first one here I want you let me just quickly go you can, there's a variety of questions okay guys over here be be prepared to have x-ray pictures because an x-ray is literally a photograph of a bone so some of the ways in which that we can ask you a question is actually by showing you a picture of an x-ray so if I were to look at this picture over here all right what it asks me to do is to label a B and C now it's looking a bit odd but what I notice what I notice and what should be a giveaway is this bone over here at the back so the question that I can ask you is what am I showing you I am showing you the pectoral let me do it over here the pectoral girdle okay because this one is a bone over there which would then be the clavicle this number B would be the scapula and what bone attaches that forms over there that would be the humerus guys it's not an arm it's a humerus so when we come to the questions that we ask you right as you can see there we go name the part of the skeleton shown in the x-ray that was right my pectoral girdle label bones A to C so I, I don't have to give you a diagram a false diagram of a skeleton I can actually show you right x-rays if you have a look at this one over here what I've done is you have to see they're trying to show you something over here and they've called it a floating shoulder so if we have a look at the questions right again what kind of questions can I ask it says using the x-ray explain what you think a condition called a floating sh a shoulder I say soldier means now even if you guys don't you're not a doctor we don't expect you to be but what do you notice here two words fracture means to break and what can you see with the bones there right there's a break so what do you think a floating shoulder is is where the clavicle is broken and what is the, what are the bones doing they are floating here they're not joined to the axial skeleton anymore so right that says there fracture now it says how do you think this condition can be corrected now I need you to think it's over here it's your clavicle am I going to put plaster of Paris over here no what do I need to do the bone needs to heal all right so when the bone what do I need to do is I'm going to need to keep my, my arm steady okay so I'm going to maybe strap it so that I can't move it so while I can't move it right then I'm not going to hurt it okay guys you need to practice a lot of revision questions all right over this we haven't done too many I wanted to get all the theory but uh, guys go over it make notes make summaries hope you had a wonderful time and I'm looking forward to seeing you next time Bye-bye.